Hello, and welcome to part 23 of a 52-week series for the Web Pro on what every web administrator needs to know to be successful in this space. My name is Scott Forsyth, and today I want to talk to you about IS security. How do you secure your web servers to ensure that they are safe from other applications? And how do you ensure that other applications are secure from it? We'd like to assume that there aren't any vulnerabilities in the code that we and our developers write, and that IIS will never have a vulnerability that impacts us. Unfortunately, reality says differently. It's been said that every real application has vulnerabilities and that no application is truly safe. How true this is, I don't know, but it tells us that we need to take every measure possible to minimize any impact that an unknown exploit being found will impact us. The technology principle that we want to look at is that of sandboxes. And you can see here this picture of this child playing happily in his sandbox and notice how he's not impacting the world around and the world around is not impacting him. You can see the drastic difference between, of course, the sand and the grass. The same thing happens in the IS world, is we want to make sure that each sandbox is completely isolated from each other, that one sandbox cannot talk to another sandbox, or to the environment around it, at least in the minimal amount possible. Now you may be asking, why do you care if it's a dedicated server? There's different situations. I've spent a lot of years managing shared web servers where you need to make sure that every website is fully protected from each other. But what about a dedicated server where you trust all the applications? Even in that situation, it's essential that you create these sound sandbox boundaries, even if you trust the different sites. And here's why. is If a hacker gets into one site, they can then start to do damage on another site, or potentially, even if it's just read-only access, they can read your web.config, your credentials for SQL Server, potentially, any other app settings that you don't want to reveal to that hacker. And actually, I've seen that happen where sites have got exploited, and then they've actually gone in and exploited other sites on the same server. Fortunately, at OrcsWeb, we've had this lockdown, and we have not had any situation that someone has exploited a shared site and been able to impact any other site on the server in all my years of working with this. And so we're thankful for that, for, because we've followed best practices in this regard for many years. And the same way, it's important to make sure that we break that down, even on a dedicated server. So today we want to talk about how we lock this down, how do we prevent it, and how do we make sure that we're set up in the best way possible. So there's four users I want to talk about, and really two big ones and then two other smaller ones. And so we start here with the application pools themselves. And you can see, let's start with our acme.com as an example. And you can see the identity right now is this application pool identity I talked about in last week's video. And we can set it, we can change it here. We have a couple system accounts, local service, local system, which is your full, you can do everything pretty well on the local box and network service, which is limited, but it does allow you network access, and it will tunnel through using the computer name account. And then the account I talked about last week is this application pool identity. We can also set a custom account. Really, as much as possible, I would use either this application pool identity I talked about last week, or you create your own custom account if you need access across the network. The advantage of the application pool identity is you don't have to manage a password at all. So let's do this for the sake of visualizing this and understanding it. Let's create a custom account right now. So let's go to local users and groups, and we're going to add a new user. Let's call it A Acme, A for App Pool, and Acme App Pool User. Make sure to set it so the password does not need to be reset, and it never expires. You want to do this manually, otherwise in 30 or 90 days, whatever your policy is, the site will break. Okay, so we add it. Now notice we don't have to add it to any group anymore. In IS6, you had to add it to a group called IS underscore WPG, but that group is now managed automatically for you. It still exists, but it's hidden in the background, and you don't have to do it. So that was it in terms of creating the user. So now we assign that user to the app pool. And that's been granted here and this top line for acme.com. Now, every request that is made for this app pool will originally be made using this account. Now, we're going to talk about impersonation and your anonymous user and some other users here in a minute. But for the most part, your access to different resources, whether that's disk, the registry, or a network resource, is going to use this identity. So what other permissions do you need to grant to your server? And let's right-click on acme.com. We'll edit permissions go to security and notice we have a lot of users in play in fact look at the users group 
if we go to acme.com notice how it works right now but we have not granted access specifically to this new user and the reason is because this is not secure we have too many permissions right now so let's go to advanced we're going to turn off inheritance so this folder has its own permissions and we're going to drop what we don't need we don't need creator owner we don't need users make sure we turn that off and we don't need trusted installer so system with full access administrators with full access and now we're going to also add our new user acme.com and then we use the principle of least privilege which says that we only grant the least amount of permissions possible to get the job done and in this case we only need read permission I happen to know that the site doesn't need write permissions and so we save this now if I refresh it though notice that it still fails and that's because we have a second user in play we see this an ACL or a permission related issue and that leads us to our second user that I'll talk about shortly but first let's recap on this first user is the application pool identity whether it's this one or a custom one that you add after you create the user you need to create access on disk for that user as I did and also if it does access a registry or if it needs to access a remote resource on the network make sure that you do that as well now the other question comes up is whether you should use a local user or a domain user and my general rule of thumb is if it's only used on a single box I will generally create a local user if it's used in multiple places or if it's used across the network then I'll create an Active Directory user so let's now move on to the second user here and this is at the authentication level within the website itself and you can see here anonymous access has it's enabled and you can see this new feature in IS7 now right now it's using this I user and that was the second user that's not set up yet so in a minute I'm gonna talk about the second one which I much prefer this bottom option but first let's get the site working to show how this I user is used so we'll edit permissions and we're gonna add the I user again we don't have the sandbox boundary because multiple sites are using the same user and we refresh and notice it now works so we notice there's two users in play the app pool identity and our anonymous user because it's not password protected now if we had this turned off the anonymous user then it's going to use something like Windows or basic auth one of these ones as well and if that was enabled and anonymous access was disabled then it's now going to come in under this user and actually let's try it we're going to disable our anonymous access which essentially password protects the site because it's going to prompt us because we have another security option which is Windows off so we refresh it asks for the user so I'm going to log in with my own user and I'm not going to save it notice that it worked now but now it used my Scott account which is in the administrators group and that's why that worked so let's now look a little bit further at this anonymous user let's enable this and it will always use this one first if both windows and anonymous access are enabled and this concept was introduced in IS7 I absolutely love it this is so much nicer and we see this application pool identity can be used for the anonymous user which basically says don't worry about managing a custom user and I wouldn't have used the I user by the way I would have set another custom user that I created myself but now we can use the application pool identity and let's go to acme.com and let's drop our I users user so now we just have the three and really only the a acme user they would be used for the authentication here and if we go to acme.com notice it still works so we can see now we only have a single user that we have to worry about to manage the site we don't have to manage the I user the anonymous user anymore much cleaner than in times past so now the question is when do you use this and when do you use this and here's my rule of thumb if you give everyone their own app pool which more and more nowadays we have more memory there is a little bit of overhead for giving everyone their own app pool memory overhead but it's really very insignificant and unless you do bulk hosting where you want to batch a whole bunch of sites together you give everyone their own app pool it's much easier to manage much cleaner and a better security boundary and then you can use this application pool identity get rid of this user that you have to manage however 
if you do share app pools between different sites, then what I would do is I would turn on the specific user, and then I would also turn on ASP.NET impersonation. And what that does is it says that as much as possible, in almost every situation, we're going to use this anonymous user to access disk rather than the app pool user. If impersonation is not set, most requests actually use the app pool user with some requests using your anonymous user. So you got a little bit of each. So impersonation is great for your shared situation. But fewer and fewer people are using shared app pools nowadays. And I recommend as much as possible don't. Give every site, give every application their own app pool. Now there's a couple other uses that could potentially be used. And here if you do have impersonation set, it's possible to tunnel through a specific user, which basically means we're not going to use the app pool identity, we're going to use the anonymous identity, and it's going to be a specific one rather than the one in anonymous access here. And actually, the kind of tunnels through anonymous and Windows or basic auth would all use a single user. I've actually never set this in a real world situation, but it is possible for you to use if you need to. And the other user that can be used, and I'm just mentioning briefly, is here on your basic settings. When you set the path to either the root of the site or if it's a VDIR, whatever it is, there's a connect as option. And sometimes this is really useful if you're using a UNC path. And again, it tunnels all disk level access through a particular user as well. So again, we can say network user, for example, that we may have set up for this situation could be used as well. And again, it's very rare that I've used this. If you can do it through your app pool user instead, that's going to be cleaner in most cases. But there are certain situations where you may want to use this. And there's a handy test settings that allows you to check the permissions and confirm that everything works. And this is something to also be aware of. OK, so to recap, the key things to keep in mind for managing security in IS is only grant the least privileges possible to get the job done. For example, at the root of the site, you almost always only want read permissions. But you may need to give something like your app data or an uploads folder write permissions. Only grant what you need to. Make sure that every website has its own unique permissions that can't talk to each other. That way a hacker can't exploit one and then do damage on another site as well. If possible, in your authentication, anonymous, you want to set this to use your application pool identity rather than a specific user. Uh, don't leave the iUser. If you do use a specific user, don't use the iUser. Otherwise, all the sites are going to have to be granted that user. Definitely don't use user's permission in your permissions on disk here as well. So security, make sure that that user's user has been removed. Uh, you can leave system, administrators, and hopefully just your one other user. And as long as you follow these basic principles, you really have a lockdown server. IIS is very secure in and of itself and it's your permissions on disk that's the most important setting that you need to keep track of. As long as you follow these principles and are careful in other ways regarding your server and not opening it up in various different ways. Of course your developers need to make sure that the website itself, that the code content, that's a different subject for another time. So thank you. Hope you found this useful and again please keep tuning back and I'd love to always hear feedback if this has been useful to you. Thanks for the feedback for everyone so far and thanks for listening.